Good afternoon. How are you guys doing? Are y'all hanging tough? I wanted to make sure he announced that I wasn't a physical therapist because I was afraid that if you had any food items, they might be heading my direction because I heard the horror stories that were going on. But um, just, just to put it out there, I am part of a team. I've been an OT now. I'm an occupational therapist. Have, has any of you had occupational therapy before? Good. Results? Okay. Not so good. And, you know, iffy, iffy. <laughs> And I'm not going to act like we haven't done desensitization therapy because it has been completed and I have tried it myself. So I'm not going to try to pretend that that's not happening. But first off, I've been an OT since 1991. So I've been fortunate to be a part of a lot of different types of treatment. Um, but I will tell you as a whole, uh, the diagnosis of RSD is part of my nightmares because, and that might be what you're dealing with in terms of therapist as a whole, because it's a scary world for us because we can't fix it right off the bat. And we want to, that's our goal. Just like um, when she was talking about being an engineer and you having the gold star, the gold star for the therapist is that we have the patient cured and they leave. Back to life, back to everything that's important to them. Unfortunately, Typically with RSD, we don't get to have that success story. So it's a really tough place. So most therapists run from that. And so putting it out there, sometimes you have possibly been caught in that network. And I hate that for you. And I hate that sometimes you get that impression that all therapists are that way. Um, and I will just try to summarize that really quickly and say that all therapists aren't that way, just like all doctors aren't that way. Um, you're going to have those therapists and those doctors that don't listen to what you're saying and my best advice to you is to leave those therapists and those doctors and remember they work for you. And if they're not giving you that eye contact and not giving you um, the time to explain your situation then my advice again is don't go back. Because we do live in a, a place where we're shifting to managed care and that's a scary world because people are put on perspectives that they have to do documentation and they have to do this while they're treating the patient and so they don't put a lot of hands on. Um, and so it's a, it's a very difficult thing for all medical professionals to try to go in and help someone because you will often find when you go to a therapist that maybe they're looking at a computer the whole time you're with them. And that's not what you need. So I'll put that out there to begin with and just try to clarify that for you. But there are great therapists out there and there are people that are trying to find better ideas. And I've heard wonderful things that are going on and I'm so excited that there's opportunity for change and there's opportunity for growth and there's opportunity for you to overcome this obstacle that hopefully has going to end this obstacle in your life and you can move forward or at least move to a place where you can get a better situation. So that being said, today what I want to talk to you a little bit about, and, and the, the title is supposed to be Restoring Function. So I want to kind of give you some background information about where I'm coming from and let you know a little bit. And if you have questions, I'm a very laid back person, so please feel free to ask me anything that you have, and I'll try to help you out. How does our little thing work, Larry? I might have to. And Larry's my good friend that <laughs> I got a chance to treat and work with. And, and we, that's how we got introduced. And then I got introduced to the whole group. And I've really been uh, fortunate to be a part. Um, this is just a statement that I really think applies. Um, I really think that if we had a lot of medical professionals that believe this way, you might be in a better situation than what you've possibly been through. It says, you never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, until you climb into his skin and walk around in it. So it's kind of in the world when I think in terms of treating someone that has RSD or complex regional pain syndrome, and I know we're all in different worlds because it took me forever to embrace that term and I have, still have a difficult time documenting it. So um, you see one patient with RSD and you've seen one patient with RSD. And that's the best way I can put it out there. There's no way I could treat Larry and then treat Miss Smith, just for a random name, that also has RSD and come out doing the exact same thing with both of them and get the exact same results. So that's my best advice is 
if a therapist is out there treating, if you treat one patient with RSD, you've treated one patient with RSD. So don't try to assume that you can generalize those treatment procedures. However, if a component of that works, great, try. So. Okay, background. I want to give you a little bit of a background to my choice of interventions and my experience with RSD. So I became a therapist in 1991 and about three months later I was living in Clearwater, Florida. I was introduced to a man that had a diesel accident. He was in a, he was in a semi and he drove and he had only, he had had some fractures in his lower extremity but really he only had a small fracture in his thumb. So I'm like, no big deal, right? That's what I'm going to treat. That's going to be easy. We're going to go through this. We're going to get it rehabbed. He's already made it through the tough part. <laughs> so we thought. So when I started treating this patient, we started noticing he was hurting really bad. And he was like, I'm just hurting. And he was swelling. His skin became shiny. We started having the sweat that was happening. And I'm like, I don't understand. So then I started researching RSD. And everything that came up was, I'm supposed to wait bear. We're supposed to get you on all fours. <laughs> so we did, and it about killed him. <laughs> it would hurt him and hurt him, and we'd go through it. Then we'd whirlpool. Then we'd try fluidotherapy. Then we'd wait bear again. Then we would do it where we even used a scale, where we would wait bear. This is that whole world that I heard y'all talking about, that desensitization that puts you through the torture. Um, did he get relief? No, not so much. Um, and every day he would hurt. He ended up doing some nerve blocks. He did some different things. We'd come back. We'd try something different. Um, went through, I went through guided imagery because we do cross that line um, with our psychology friends and um, took him through a whole guided imagery about being at the beach, this wonderful experience to try to relax him. So this is something else that you might want to make sure that your therapist knows a lot about you. <laughs> After I finished, he goes, it was okay, but I really hate the beach. <laughs> so, <laughs> unfortunately, I chose the wrong, <laughs> the wrong pain relief because, you know, you got to go with what they like. So we should have went on the mountain trip, not the beach trip. So there you go. So make sure your therapist does a little bit of personal inventory and finds out what's important to you and what you care about when you're trying to find a person that can work with you and help you the most. Um, Time went on, I've treated other patients, I stayed in contact with that patient for a long period of time. He got some relief, but he did lose a lot of function in his extremity. I don't, when I moved away from Florida, I don't believe there was near the support group that I'm seeing here. And I can't say enough about support groups, no matter what diagnosis you're dealing with. Like I know there's lots of comorbid, I can't ever get that word out, comorbidities, but that you deal with, I think that a support group, I don't mean to say, it's just, there's why reinvent the wheel over and over and over again. If you know that there's resources there and if you can find them, oh my goodness, if nothing else, just to have someone to talk to that can kind of understand what you're going through. I can't speak enough about, because I live in a small town, we live in Coleman, there's not a lot of support groups that we find. In fact, I called for a patient of mine not for the RSD support group, got put on hold forever, was ending up calling the gym, I wasn't even calling the right place. So finding those networks of support group is a very difficult thing. Um, I can, so I can't say enough about how much I feel like that's a very positive force in making you have a more quality of life. So moving forward several years, I was fortunate, I had always had treated patients that had had a lot of swelling and edema, which kind of correlates with our RSD. Um, and I treated patients that had had breast cancer. And so a lot of those patients, I don't know your experience, but most of us have experienced at least someone in our family that has survived or made it through cancer. And then sometimes you might even find that after those experiences, they may also develop RSD. And they also develop lymphedema. So it's this little side note of another comorbidity that can cause problems. Well, I was fortunate that I was working at a place where they were experiencing, uh, looking for treatment techniques for the lymphedema, and I was able to go through a VADR certification process. So I don't know what you know about that, but in a brief background, 
Vodder certification is a lymphedema drainage, so it's a manual lymph drainage. And our lymph nodes are those superficial nodes that uh, in gross anatomy we threw away, <laughs> but they're very important in our system. And, and what they do um, is they help move the fluid throughout our body, just in a general term. And they, they run with our blood vessel system. Well, with manual lymph drainage, we use a very, very light touch, very, very, very superficial, um, and we help to start that process of moving fluid. And so hopefully our outcomes are that that patient has a reduced extremity, that the, the extremity gets smaller, and typically it does. It's a very odd situation because we follow that light touch with a very, very tight pressure wrap, and, it's a, and, and that helps create what we call a working treatment. So I'm just putting all that out there so you have a little back, background. Um, through that, I found that patients sometimes could tolerate it, sometimes they couldn't. Some days were good, some days no way. So, so those are the things that as a therapist you have to look at and you have to weigh for that patient and it has to be individualized. So I'm just going to put that out there because I want you to have that in your toolkit for surviving this. RSD is that you need to know that every treatment technique may not work for you that day. It doesn't mean that it won't work for you on a different day, or it doesn't mean that it will never work for you. It just means that you need to be aware that it's okay to say, this isn't going to work for me today, and that that therapist should listen to you. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go through my theory and my ideas on this compression technique, and I'm just going to tell you it's, it's completely theoretical and that's really how Larry and I kind of collaborated on it and we worked together just trying to find anything that would provide him some relief when I met him. How, many, how long ago did we meet, Larry? Forever ago? <laughs> so, so, so when we look at the pain signal process, we all know that pain signals, y'all know this, I think I've heard it all day probably and yesterday and probably for 10 years, but on that whole process, we look at it my thought process was, well, how can I do something that might get to the brain faster than that pain signal? Is there anything I could do that would travel faster on a different nerve fiber and interrupt that pain signal? And then that's what I wanted to look at is, could I find if compression could elicit the, get, the gate and control action and work by inhibiting pain signals. So can I get in there and somehow inhibit a pain signal? And if it works, great. And that's pretty much what we collaborated on. Let's just try it. If it doesn't work, we'll stop. But let's just try. So this gives you that whole lovely little thing that y'all have seen several times, looking at all of our, of our neurological components and thinking about how our, our brain works and how our it all has drove you crazy for several times or you wouldn't be here right now. I'll skip through. So let's look back, thinking back to childhood. When we fall, what was our first reaction? You know, when you fall, when you grab, when you, when you fall, what's your first reaction? You, you grab whatever's hurting, right? So that's, that's what the deep pressure thought is. So if this deep pressure, so if I, if I hurt something, if we get a boo-boo, if our children get boo-boos, they grab their legs, right? If they are their elbow or wherever it might be, or if a nurse is giving you a shot or taking an injection, um, they put pressure. So it's to counteract that pain signal that you're getting. So that's the reason that we even thought in terms of let's try this compression and see if it works. Um, I had this little cute video to add in here. Uh, theory, just a theory, but if if it's there's, if there's a chance it could work, then let's try it. So. The video, I don't know how many people have enjoyed Dumb and Dumber in your life, but the, whenever he's saying, so there's more, is there a chance that it could work? And she said, well, more like a million to one. And she said, so you're saying there's a chance. So, <laughs> so you're saying there's a chance. That's what I thought. Well, if there's one little chance, let's try it. Let's just try it. And if it didn't work, then we'll reboot and we'll try it again. And that's, that's my hope, is that we could try and to see. Okay. <sighs> we talked about this, and that's that skin stimulation, and we've already talked about that, so I'm not even going to approach the whole sensory and what terrible things I've went through with some, some rough stuff. But 
When you look at everything that goes into the deep pressure and overriding the pain signal, that's part of why maybe that the weight bearing was used, why maybe the, sens the skin sensation things were used, because people were just trying to make it work. However, at some point, whenever it's causing such extreme pain and causing such a reaction, if it's ruining any progress you're making, that's a time that a therapist should step back and say, let's don't do this any longer. Let's look, let's look for a different option. So use of pre pressure. Pressure can be applied with the entire hand, the heel of the hand, the fingertip, the knuckle, the ball of the thumb, or using both of your hands. Pressure is usually most effective if it is applied as firmly as possible without causing pain. Just, just curious, how many people tolerate pressure on their extremity or anywhere on their body when they're in the severe pain? Do y'all tolerate deep pressure? Is that better than light touch, typically? Yes. That's what, that's what I've found, too, with most patients I've worked with. They can't, the light touch almost is more like, more painful. Lots of different descriptions, but more painful. <clears throat> so, and I think that was Larry's theory, too, is that in terms of, he said, the light touch, I can't tolerate it. And he, Larry doesn't have, he doesn't have a problem with speaking his mind much, Larry, do you? <laughs> so he wouldn't have a problem letting me know, no, this is not going to work. So that's probably a positive part of our, our working relationship, too. No, mm -mm, not going to be able to tolerate it today. So here's what the compression bandaging looks like, though. I'm going to show it to you up front. It's, it's, an, it's an intense bandaging. And it's not one that, um, that every person wants or wants to wear around, but it's something we do for short periods of time. So when we try it, when we use that, that MLD compression bandaging, what it is is a gradient wrap. So it does deep pressure, but we don't want to constrict. So that's the scary part. You don't want to cause it to be a pressure that um, cuts off circulation. We wanted a pressure that creates a gradient so that you're actually pushing, if for MLD, we're pushing fluid upwards into our body. But with uh, the compression bandaging, which can be used on the upper or lower extremity, any extremity, um, we actually want the gradient pressure so that we have a reaction so it's tighter to looser, in an easy way of saying it. The key factors with it is the type of compression bandaging you use, because when you look at it, it looks just like an ACE bandage, but it's really not an ACE bandage. We use what's, uh, this is, Comperlin's just a brand, but it has a different amount of stretchy. You know how an ACE bandage just gives. The Comperlin does not. So it, it's, it's not gonna be that nice, like smooth, easy breathing. It's a good, tight compression. And I think that's the difference that like just someone wrapping your arm with an ACE bandage, that when you have that nice deep pressure, it, it sustains that deep pressure. And I'll put this out there. There's been times when we've treated before that maybe you have that deep pressure and you could, one day we might find that Larry could tolerate a, up higher, but then we wouldn't go as high because that, the next day, it, uh, he couldn't tolerate that. So just putting that information out there, you have to do, the therapist would have to do what's most appropriate for that patient. All right, I've got Larry up here, so I'm gonna do a quick demo, but I, and I want you to feel it afterwards, and I'm gonna let him be the judge on how he can tolerate that. I'm not gonna say, um, you know, he can tolerate everybody coming in and touching him, but it is a gradient pressure. And I know it's gonna be difficult to see, so I apologize, but I'm gonna step down for just a moment. And I'm switching mics. Okay. Do I have to turn this one off? Will that look good? Okay. Um, and Larry can speak to it too. I always have to put a stocking net first. The stocking net is a boundary. He, he had, he couldn't, it, we didn't try it without the stocking net, without using that because um, it, it, hurt too, it hurt too much, didn't it, Larry? She got smacked a couple times. Only once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> Larry's pretty fast. <laughs> She's a good redneck therapist. <laughs> I can move. 
sorry, I'll laugh loud, so that's all you're going to hear echoing in the room. I'm going to go ahead and put this on you, Larry. So I have my stocking net, and I always cut the little thumb. You'll probably seem similar. My oh, hands are cold, Larry. I'm sorry. And typically, I would have him laying down so he wouldn't have to hold his extremity up. I know. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna go to the lower component today. Is that gonna be okay? All right. And normally I wouldn't cord right here, but just because I'm trying not to get his shoulder moved over there. I also use Artiflex. So Artiflex is like a the, the underlying of a cast the easiest way for me to say it. So we've got lots of ways to keep it from cutting into his skin. That's the best way I can put it out there for you. Watch, watch this, how she wraps and turned this in Germany. <laughs> yes. I'm not kidding you. It felt, um, I was fortunate that the Vodder finished, I'm sorry, am I hurting you? Yep. My hand, I'll grab. You got my nerves Your with me. Your hands are cold. Go ahead. That's, you're you're, you're stuck with a girl with a warm heart. You're talking about. No, so I was fortunate that my, my training began in Birmingham, then I went to West Virginia, and then I finished in Austria for two weeks, um, which sounds really great, but I was dealing with Hildegard, and she was pretty scary. <laughs> so, so if you didn't get it right, you were in trouble. I'm just going to take it right up here. I wanted Anybody to make. Any questions? Are y'all y'all good? Can y'all see it all? all right. She she can. Her. You need a therapist like her because when I've been to I've been to California. You have and we have surgery and for two hours for two hours at the University of California Hand Rehabilitation Center, he worked on this hand. <laughs> so she's awesome, but she can tell you to the mercury tension, how much she's pulling on getting that compression. She's the only one that will, I'll let do it. Well, I try to listen to my patients. That's my biggest thing I can offer is that I try to listen. And, and that's, if you can't find that, I'm, I'm still available, so come find me. <laughs> Okay. Okay, so I'm going to start, and we also can do a finger wraps, but I'm going to start with the first level of the Compraland. Um, and excuse my southern accent, it's probably Compraland would probably be a better way to say it, but I'm saying it like an Alabama person, Compraland. <laughs> right. I just want to let you know I anchor at the, I anchor at the wrist always. Yeah. I'll be starting with it tighter and then I'll loosen up as I go up the arm. So start tight is the That's the trick. trick. In any limb, whether it's your foot, ankle, or hand. I feel the compression but I don't feel any loss of circulation or anything. I always make sure afterwards that he can move his fingers really well and that we're able to not be losing any digits today. No digits coming off today. <laughs> and like I said, it's, you know, it may not be for everyone, but if there is a chance that it can make it better for you for that day and you get one hour of pain relief, that's one hour you can spend with your family without hurting, that's one hour that you can enjoy dinner, that's one hour, you know, and I think we don't need to underestimate that one hour. So after it's done, does it come back worse? After it's done, does it come back worse? No. Let me, no, no. I'm going to let Larry speak to that. Hold on one second. Good question, but the only thing that, that is an issue is the heat buildup. So what I do is, uh, without telling her, 
I take the ace off because it's you know kind of like waterproof, but I leave this soft stuff and I just turn a fan on it and then I s sneak behind her and wrap my hand back up again. <laughs> yeah, air dry. Yeah. Being said, we live in Alabama and the summers are hot. Yeah. <laughs> so. Should have brought one for everybody. It'd make it more fun, wouldn't it? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. All right. Larry wanted me to mention why I use different sizes. Each size, of course, the hand we want to have function in the hand, but as we move up, we go with larger size. Remember, bandaging on bandaging causes more pressure. So the more layers, the more pressure. So be aware of that, whoever might be giving you treatment, that when I put a bandage on top of a bandage, I'm gonna be having more pressure. So you wanna be cautious because that can decrease circulation. Don't wanna cause another problem with the treatment. <laughs> don't let a therapist do something you don't want them to do. Always. Don't. I'll let that idiot work on my wrong hand and I... Oh, sorry, Larry. I got yelled at more than a doctor yelled at. I'm, su I'm surprised Ramona handled that one very well. <laughs> she didn't. <laughs> Sorry. You got yelled at by your wife? No, I'm talking about Ramona handling the doctor. <laughs> Y'all know Ramona. <laughs> It's the pull. It's the pull. Yeah. Yeah, the pull is not as t intense on the, as I move upwards. So the only part of my hand that really gets hot or my arm is my hand. The palm area. And sometimes I don't have to take the, the ace off to get the fan. I, the air will blow in through the end of it. I'm not going to go all the way up with Larry, but normally I would. Normally I don't like using the little um, clips. I usually use uh, tape. No, and I don't use the clips, so I usually use tape. Of course, I didn't bring the I didn't bring the tape with me, but I just wanted you to see what that technique looks like. And Larry's a good sport and let me do that with him in front of everyone. So it's pretty intense, Larry. <laughs> so how you feel? Or you? See, I wish I could come up with a cure right here. Wouldn't that have been awesome? Then I could have the whole line. <laughs> but it was like what we were talking. There's a chance. And if there's a chance, then we're excited. Um, so that's, yes. Does, after a therapist shows Larry what's done, to, could Ramona do, do that? Yes. Okay. Yes, you can train caregivers to help do this. I'm not going to say it will be the exact same, but if we get in the world of, and you get pressure and you get relief, and the pressure gives you relief, then you're, then you're hitting that block and then every day, maybe if it gives me a little bit more relief, then I get another hour or another 30 minutes or 15 minutes. And, and in terms of occupational therapy, I always say I'm an OT geek <laughs> because I, the big thing with OT is that we want people to do what occupies your time. That's what an OT is supposed to do. And so our goal is that turn this off is that you're able to do things that are most important to you so if if for some reason this allows you to do I don't know brush your hair if it allows you to do um, uh, dinner and drink a glass of wine or maybe that doesn't mix with medications whatever it might be um, you know it allows you to have a little bit of your life back and I think that what she was saying earlier about that um, the, the little components, you don't want to underestimate those little components because they become big components in your quality of life. And so that's what I hope you find. And I hope that um, if this treatment works, I'd be happy to help anyone or teach anyone how to try it. And if it gives you that little bit of component of your life back and you need a therapist or can, can't find a therapist that would help you find that, then I'll be happy to talk to you too. So I hope the best for you guys. I want to get, end it with a little quote that one of my friends uses. Um, and it's, a, it's kind of an emotional one to me, but 
Um, there was a little boy, and y'all may have heard it before, that was on the beach. And this isn't the guided imagery, by the way. <laughs> and, the, and he was walking down the beach, and there were all thousands and thousands of these starfish had washed up on the seashore. And he was going out and picking up the starfish one by one and throwing them back out into the ocean. And a man came walking up to him and said, that's, son, you don't have a chance. That's not going to help at all. He said, doesn't matter what you're doing. Don't you see there's too many for you ever to help? And he goes and picks up one more starfish and he said, but it matters to this one. So that's what I hope for you guys is that you find that one person that cares enough to help you and find what matters to you. So thank you guys. Thank <laughs> you.